I welcome you. Uh, we are uh, here to uh, listen to Hanako O'Leary talk about her, her work. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce you to her. Um, her work is, uh, the, is in the current exhibition at the NSC Art Gallery. Um, it's speaking out. So if you haven't seen that, come by. Um, I urge any of you who are sort of daunted by this kind of uh, interaction to come by after this. Hanako will be in the gallery and can answer questions there. There's also coffee and cookies involved in that. So that's a little bit of like a bribe to get you there. Um, uh, da, da, da. She, uh, Hanako is an artist who works in sculpture, public art, uh, comic illustration. Um, she received BFAs, not one, but two, right? Mm -hmm. in, in ceramics and sculpture from the University of Illinois, uh, Champaign-Urbana, and an MFA in arts leadership from Seattle University, um, mm -hmm. which might be interesting for you guys to, to talk about what the options are for people who are interested in the arts who may not, you know, like, what, what are options, anyway. So uh, she is an artist and an arts administrator working here in Seattle. Um, and is a, re a resident artist at Seward Park Clay Studio. Mm -hmm. right. um, just plucking lines from her bio, her work explores the modern feminist agenda through a millennial lifestyle and a biracial perspective. I present to you Hanako O'Leary. All right, thank you, and thank you, Amanda. Um, Hello, my name's Hanako, and thank you all for coming out today. Um, I'm an artist, and in my work, I unravel and rebuild my own personal identity myth through investigating Japanese culture in an American context. I work predominantly in the medium of clay and paint under the pseudonym Hanya Girl. Currently, I'm in the middle of creating a series of paintings um, called Hashtag Millennial Fail. Today, I'd like to share with you the origins and current state of this body of work and how a simple daily exercise evolved into an examination of white supremacy, colonialism, toxic masculinity, and violence against marginalized bodies within our own cultural roots. And also our favorite internalized oppression that will be part of it as well. Um, so since it does influence my work, I'm going to give you a little background information and a brief synopsis of the origins of Hanya Girl. So in this picture here, you see my parents, my mom, she's an Asian lady who immigrated here from Japan, and my dad is a white dude from Wisconsin. They met in Japan, they married, and they moved to the US. By the time I came along, followed by my siblings, they began to make very conscious cultural compromises or exchanges, depending on how you look at it. Each would claim half of my name. We would be raised in my father's country, where I would belong as a citizen, but in my mother's home, we were required to speak her language and practice her customs. On weekdays, I would go to regular public, public school. On Sunday, I would go to Japanese school. Until I turned 18 and left home for college, Christmas, Easter, and Halloween were spent with extended family in the Midwest, while summer break was spent with extended family in Hiroshima, Japan. And you can guess which was spent where in this picture. Um, art was the one way I could make something that reflected me. Oh, sorry. Growing up, I, uh, I growing up feeling like I'd never be, um, oh, okay. Back. Code switching from east to west, physically, verbally, and psychologically, was a daily practice until the day I left home for college. Growing up, I was constantly aware of my cultural surroundings. I found it awkward and stressful, straddling these distinct and often conflicting set of cultural identities. Making art was the one way I could explore and sometimes even bridge this gap. Art was the one way I could make something that reflected me, two halves and a whole, new and mixed. While making art, I could be all or both or nothing. I could be whatever I felt like being. I grew up feeling like I'd never be a proper Asian or a real white girl, but I knew being an artist could transcend these limiting roles. 
In 2007, I left home to study painting at the University of Illinois. And a little disclaimer here, uh, moving on, I don't know how things have changed since I was an undergraduate college student, but when I was in school, uh, I never once saw my professors or any of my lecturing artists show me um, or share with me the work they made in undergrad. I don't know why this is so taboo or if somehow it's unprofessional, but the work I made at this point in life very much informs what I create now, so I want you to all get ready because I'm about to show you. <laughs> Um, so when I began making work towards my BFA, I wanted to continue exploring the sense of uncertainty and loneliness I felt in my cultural identity. Much of my early work dealt with the sense of inadequacy I felt as I tried to live up to my Japanese mother's expectations while trying to fit into a white world. During critiques, however, I observed students creating conceptual and political work which focused on ideas, not emotions, were more highly regarded by my professors. While I wanted to speak specifically about my Asian American background, at some point within these institutional walls, I began to think that directly talking about my cultural background was too folksy or juvenile and that it wasn't cerebral enough. Um, so I switched my focus into ceramic sculpture instead because I, could remove, I, could, because I couldn't remove myself from the painting process. But clay gave me space to dilute my own presence in the work. I could be more abstract and gestural, focusing on technique rather than content. I, I left believing that in the art world, work around cultural identity was unintellectual and therefore unimportant. So I made work that hinted at these feelings of displacement, but avoiding expressing my personal background. I tried to remove myself, my face, and my own story from the work as much as possible. It amazes me to think how different things might have been if I went to school now, where identity politics is part of the national discourse, and how things may have been different if my work had, just, had not just been evaluated by mostly white, mostly male faculty. Looking back during this period, my priority was to make art devoid of cultural identity, even though this quest to find my cultural identity was the very thing that drew me to being an artist in the first place. So, now that you've caught a glimpse of my underbelly, let's skip forward as times change, bodies grow, and identities become more complicated. In 2012, I left the Midwest and came here to Seattle with the intention of working in clay. But as many of you may know, finding an affordable studio space and the time to work while keeping a roof over your head can be a challenge in Seattle. And so in my search for this, I stumbled into becoming Hanya Girl. The name Hanya Girl is a combination of the two words Hanya and Girl. Girl, spelled with three R's, comes from the 1990s punk rock movement, Riot Girl. It is a blend of grr, representing the sound of animals growling, and girl. The word refers to women who are strong, independent, and defy the establishment. Being a 90s kid, this serves as a nod to the countercultural movement that would later introduce me to feminism. Hanya is the face of an ancient Japanese female demon. A carved wooden mask worn in traditional Japanese theater, it possesses sharp bull-like horns, metallic eyes, and a leering mouth. The Hanya mask portrays the spirits of women who feel so deeply betrayed by mankind, their souls prematurely leave this world for the spirit realm, while their mortal bodies linger among us in a demonic state, hungry for revenge. Depending on the gesture of the actor who wore it and the angle at which it was lit on stage, the mask would exude an aura of erotic danger, demonic rage, deranged mirth, or tormented sorrow. It is believed by some that the Hanya mask is an old Japanese word for wisdom, and the mask earned this name because for the mask maker to fully capture this expression, to be able to render the demonic and dangerous, as well as the sor sorrowful and tormented in one face, he would have to understand the deep complexity of female suffering. He would have to be very wise. The fear of the feminine 
was born out of male society long ago and still lives in the minds of many. Men still wear the Hanya mask on the no stage today. They tattoo it onto their bodies and they claim it as their own without much thought to its cultural context. In a world dominated by patriarchy, the feminine is always assigned a mask. By applying Hanya's face onto mine in a context that reflects my personal experience as a biracial woman, I feel like I'm taking it back. Using this ancient, iconic, macho Japanese image to tell my very contemporary feminine American story. I gain power and pleasure from appropriating this symbol, as my Hanya mask does not serve to hide or demonize, rather it reveals the power of our emotional core. So that's why as I talk to you um, about this series, hashtag millennial fail, you'll notice that the subjects in my works are always wearing this Hanya mask. So in the beginning, when I started making these works, I found myself without access to a clay studio and felt stuck in, our, in an artistic slump. The longer I went without creating, the more depressed and worthless I felt. So for the sake of my own mental health, I needed to force myself to make something, anything. And the most available medium to me at the time was drawing, which could be done at my desk, in my room, with just a piece of paper and a pen. So setting myself a goal for creating one drawing a day, I would post my work in, on Instagram to find community and to keep myself motivated. And at first, being in the depressed state that I was, I didn't know what to draw, but I noticed that my friend had just sent me this postcard depicting an old Japanese woodblock print. The woman in the image felt very familiar to me, and since I didn't know what else to draw, I decided I'd just go ahead and copy it. So I copied the image, but drew the subject wearing a Hanya mask and put a phone in her hand. Suddenly, I knew exactly who she was and what she wanted to say. I began making quick selfie drawings based off these old compositions, focusing around the subject of online dating and navigating the digital world. Mostly meant to be humorous, I combined trending topics at the time and intertwined them with images from old Japan. The hashtags I used as a caption on, Instagram, on my Instagram post naturally served as its title. After a while, I became more attached to the work and ab abandoned the rule of making one drawing a day. The images slowly got more complicated and took more than a day to complete. Sometimes I had a few of them going at the same time. I began to regain my excitement for the artistic process and felt excited by how many Japanese woodblock prints of women existed where I could simply modernize it by throwing a phone into the composition. <laughs> While drying, I would often listen to the news and scroll through my newsfeed. It didn't take that long before the streaming political content began to affect my work. Soon my images were responding to current events. Beginning around the time of the trial of Stanford rapist Brock Turner, my image took a sharp turn for the political. No longer did I use hashtags as a punchline or an afterthought. They came first, driving my content and depicting how I chose my source images. So as Trump became a daily appearance in my news feed, I completely lost, uh, lost interest in making Tinder jokes as I was before, and my art became a coping mechanism and an act of resistance as I tried to digest all the hatred and violence that was constantly spewing into my own personal space via any electronic device that was connected to Wi-Fi. And in the aftermath of our most recent presidential election, as the spotlight of identity politics, specifically racial identity politics, was glaring in all our faces, I needed to really understand who I am, how I identify, and how that fits into our current politics. Part of this was because I felt alienated by my own whiteness, but I also felt that while the country needed to change, I needed to change as well. I needed to decolonize my mind. So I threw myself deeper into the one thing that has always helped me figure out who I am, my artistic practice. I began research, researching the source images that came across, um, that I was using and came across some interesting history. Until this point, 
I had just been copying old compositions and making it fit into a current context through pairing them with trending hashtags and references to recent events. And except for the most recent works I shared with you, the subject matter had been lighthearted, poking fun of this cis-heteropatriarchy that I operated in, but never offering any serious critique of it. <coughs> Interestingly enough, this quality parallels the original source images and their role in Japanese art history. Turns out these images, created in the early 20th century Japan, are key works in, an uki in ukiyo-e history as part of the movement called Shinhanga, literally meaning neo-woodblock prints. In this movement that flourished around the first half of the 1900s, artists revived the dying art of ukiyo-e, or Japanese woodblock printing, through maintaining traditional printing methods and themes of landscapes, famous places, and beautiful women, but incorporating Western elements, such as shading and individualized expressions of mood. At this point, ukiyo-e prints were considered by the Japanese as mass commercial products, not fine art. Decades of modernization and westernization had subordinated the value of this art form under European oil paintings and sculptures. Ironically, they were highly collectible in Europe as the continent was experiencing the peak of Orientalism. Shinhanga was a movement created by artists to target this incredibly lucrative niche market of European collectors through appealing to their Western appetites for nostalgic and romanticized views of Japan. So what's interesting to me is of how out of all of the Japanese imagery available to me from a childhood frequently spent in Japan to the vast expanse of what I could have found on the internet, the first thing that piqued my interest was a movement of artwork that intentionally removed its own narrative, catering to the milquetoast tastes of Western eyes seeking oriental images. So I realized that all these years spent away from home, trying to make it in modern American society, my Japanese half was deeply buried under priorities of a white world. Trying to remove myself from this Western mode of making and thinking that I've grown accustomed to, I dug deeper into the history of ukiyo-e. Who were these beautiful women and what had happened to them as they lived life amongst these iconic landscapes? I hungered for source images which offered a more historic, more narrative context. Work made with the intent to celebrate Japanese-ness, not sell it. And I found in the latter half of the 1800s, where ukiyo-e artists took their last stand, and I found it in the, uh, in the latter half of the 1800s, where ukiyo-e artists took their last stand against the oncoming flood of westernization. And so in this movement, I met my current ukiyo-e muse, muse, an artist who went by the name of Tsukioka Yoshitoshi. And um, his original artwork is there in the corner. It is in this following por portion of the talk, I want to walk you through my reinterpretation of a series of famous works centered around a historic Japanese tale illustrated by Yoshitoshi and his contemporaries, and how I reshape the narrative as I understand it in today's cultural and political context. So a little bit more on Tsuki, uh, Yoshitoshi first. Um, Tsukioka Yoshitoshi and his contemporaries were active in the late 1800s, a period when Japan had, for the first time ever in its history, opened its borders to international trade and was undergoing rapid cultural shifts due to Western influences. At the same time, the country was experiencing rampant violence as the feudal samurai system that had ruled the nation for the last 650 years began to unravel. And so the art of ukiyo-e had all but disappeared as photography took its place, and Western styles of painting became more popular. Nonetheless, in a Japan that was turning away from its own past, Yoshitoshi is remembered to have single-handedly managed to push the traditional Japanese woodblock print to a new level, illuminating it with one last burst of glory before it effectively died with him in 1892, where the art form would lie dormant until its revival in the neo-woodblock movement or the Shinhanga movement of the 1920s. And I want to point out too, um, 
Also during this time, there was a lot of um, Western inks being imported. So their pigments were also becoming much brighter. And in this movement, um, these artists, as well as the artists of the Shinhanga movement, were incorporating lots of Western elements of shading and you know, individualized expressions that you'll be seeing in the next few slides. Um, but again, their approach was to celebrate their own unique Japanese history and identity as opposed to just making it like a commercially um, attractive thing. Okay, so this story, titled The Priest Mongaku at the Waterfall of Naichi, is about a warrior priest Mongaku, the advisor to the first shogun who began the samurai warrior class, which went on to rule feudal Japan for the next 650 years until we get to the point of Yoshitoshi. So pictured here is a print by Yoshitoshi, um, I'm sorry, a print by Yoshitoshi's mentor, Kuniyoshi. So he's the guy who taught Yoshitoshi like everything he knows. The image depicts priest Mongaku practicing takigyo, an ancient Japanese practice of waterfall meditation. Mongaku is a D-list samurai lusting for the famous medieval beauty Kesa Gozen, the wife of his A-list boss. After relentlessly trolling Kessa for her affection, she finally gave, gave in, promising to bed him, but only if he first killed her husband. Mongaku was happy to comply. They conspired to slay him in his sleep. Meanwhile, unknown to Mongaku, Kessa sent her husband away for the night, cut off her famously beautiful long hair, and made her bed in his room. Later that night, Mongaku snark, snuck into the dark bedroom, swiftly decapitated the sleeping figure, and ran out into the night. Elated by his victory, Mongaku held out his trophy to admire it in the moonlight. To his horror, he saw the head of Kessa, the object of his desire, held tightly in his blood-drenched fist. Overcome with shame, he abandoned his sword and set off to repent for 21 days by sitting under the freezing waters of the Naichi waterfall. So I took this image, um, I really related to this story, and I reinterpreted it like I did with my last um, drawings. And here we have Hanya Girl as Mongaku. Uh, the title of this piece is Hashtag Identity Politics. Overcome with shame for who she is and what she has stood for and failed to defend, she sits under the roaring stream. She looks for answers. I could deeply relate to Mongaku's crime his extreme act of penance, as well as Kessa's confusing act of defiance and self-sacrifice. Being half white and half Asian, this story flooded me with memories of making my own bed and waiting in the dark as my white half tiptoes in to slaughter the rest of me. At times, I would mean it as an act of defiance, but in truth, it was just easier than standing up for who I am or understanding where I come from. Now that the vote is in, unveiling the society that we have been complicit in creating, I am left asking myself, how do I awaken from this spell of white supremacy? How do I decolonize my mind? So Mongaku's penance was a very popular subject for ukiyo-e artists. And perhaps this is because Japan is a guilt-based culture, placing high priority on the concept of hansei, or guilt-based self-reflection, meaning to acknowledge one's own mistake and pledge improvement instead of getting defensive, hashtag white fragility, only through understanding what you've been doing wrong and committing to do things differently can you improve as an individual. Mongaku had to throw away his sword, a symbol of power and status in feudal Japan, to fully free himself of his greed and violence. What, power of sim what, uh, what symbols of power do we carry? Maybe we carry it between our legs, or in our wallets, or maybe we emit it through our skin. We can't always throw these things away, but we can choose whether or not to believe in them. Entering the waterfall, Mongaku pledged to repent for 21 days. He made this pledge in the beginning of December. Winter was setting in, and the water grew colder. Twice, he could only hold out for three days before losing consciousness and being uh, washed down to the bottom of the river. Both times, he was rescued by passing town folk. They told him he was crazy, that what he set out to do was impossible. But Mongaku could not be stopped. On the seventh day of the third try, the waters were colder than ever, 
and the freezing temperatures gripped his flesh and pierced his lungs. He noticed he was no longer breathing, and his body was frozen and stiff. Mongaku could feel his soul rise through his skin, away from the water and into the open air. He could feel himself swaying under the force of the waterfall, until finally his frozen body tumbled down into the water. While his body dropped down, he felt his spirit rise up. Just as Mongaku's spirit is about to leave the mortal realm, Buddha sent down from the heavens two acolytes, Kannon, the goddess of compassion and mercy, and Fudomyo, the great wisdom king of fire. They hoist up Mongaku's lifeless body from the depths of the river and gently place him back under the waterfall, where he awakens, spirit reunited with flesh. He is blessed with wisdom, compassion, and spiritual fire to help him complete his 21 days of penance under the ice-cold water. So Yoshitoshi also did his own version of this scene. And in this vertical diptych, he offers us an aerial view of Mongaku being lifted out of the falls. Through the two panels, Yoshitoshi separates Kanon with Fudomyo, compassion with fire. As the viewer, we sit off in the distance, parallel with Kanon, concerned but inactive. Fudo is the one doing the heavy lifting, supporting Mongaku's mortality as he fights to survive the brutal indifference of the natural world. It is of great interest to me that in Buddhism, Fudomyo is often known as the immovable wisdom king, and pictured with his sword of wisdom, he is often pictured with his sword of wisdom, which cuts through deluded and ignorant minds, and a rope which he uses to bind those who are ruled by their violent passions and reckless emotions. A guardian of temple entrances, he is known to turn violent anger into focused energy for pilgrims who wish to learn the ways of Buddha. It is also interesting to me that he is depicted as brown. So far in my journey to create these 88 works, Fudo is the only dark-skinned figure I see repeatedly depicted in ukiyo-e. This is likely because Buddhism, uh, Buddhist imagery was originally imported from India. But to me, as I reimagine this story in a contemporary context, the figure of Fudo and his mission to cut through ignorance reminds me of the black, brown, immigrant, and indigenous voices that, I've, that have paved our way to liberation today. So Yoshitoshi's image of lifting Mongaku's spirit and body, guiding him to finish his penance and journey to rebirth, inspired this second, second image in my triptych. I titled this rendition, Millennial Fail, hashtag Stay Angry. Though Mongaku is often depicted being lifted out of death by Fudomyo and Kannon, personified forms of fire and compassion, I'm currently unable to fit Kannon into the picture. No matter what color we are, where we come from, as Americans, we are all products of a white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. And that makes me mad. And as a person of color, as a woman, I'm furious. I believe, this anger, I believe it is this anger that will drive me to better understand the society that has shaped me. It is this fire that will help me combat and survive this system of hatred and bigotry we live in. Mercy and compassion will come, but it's not here right now. And perhaps it will come later, uh, but for now I didn't fit into the picture. But what about Kessa? I'm sure you're all wondering, what about Kessa? So um, what was going on in her mind uh, that she thought it was a good idea to go and get herself decapitated? This story is not complete without examining the true heroine of this story, Kessa Gozen, celebrated in Japan as a woman of righteous principle and filial piety. I want you, I want you to ponder this story from her perspective. So the following is all believed to be true in Japan and is part of their written history. Kesa Gozen is the only daughter of a widow of a local war hero. She lives with her single mother in genteel poverty at the edge of town. As children, her mother adopted into their home the young Mongaku, Kesa's cousin, when his parents were killed in war. Growing up together, Kesa and Mongaku were close friends. But as Kesa's beauty begins to blossom, 
So does Mangaku's feelings for her. And with time, their relationship slowly grows more complicated. When Mongaku turns 16, he is recruited to join the local military clan and leaves home to train. Before leaving, he urges his aunt to promise him Kessa's hand in marriage for when he comes back. While she is reluctant, Mongaku is insistent. And finally, exhausted by his persistence, Kessa's mother complies, promising him they will wed upon his return. With sword swinging adventure in front of him and a wife lined up for his return, Mongaku sets off on his journey being a basic samurai bro, catcalling and manspreading his way through feudal Japan. So while Mongaku is off training and warring with his local gang of feudal thugs, five years pass. In these five years, Kessa's beauty grows to become the talk of the land. Many suitors come seeking Kessa's hand in marriage, but her mother turns them down, uploading her promise to Mongaku. Finally, she is approached by Watanabe Wataru, a rich, handsome, up-and-coming samurai. Five years, after five years of waiting for Mongaku, <coughs> Kessa's mother can no longer turn down or fight off her suitors, each time they outshine the last in their rank and with their dowry. As a single aging mother, surviving off the dwindling wealth of her long-dead husband, she can no longer hold out for Mongaku and agrees to wed her daughter to this handsome, powerful suitor. And so they are wed. And just as soon as the knot is tied, we can all guess what happens. <laughs> Mongaku comes strolling back into the picture with a new horse, new weapons, and growing reputation as a ruthless fighter. Everything has changed except for his entitled machismo attitude. Catching a glimpse of his old friend and crush, he is so taken aback by her beauty, now in full bloom, his cherished childhood feelings of love and longing are set ablaze with a man's overpowering passion and desire. It doesn't take long for Mongaku to get the scoop on Kessa's relationship status. He is outraged that his agreement with Kessa's mother, his own aunt and adopted mother, was not upheld. He storms back to his childhood home. Without giving any notice, without giving any notice, he bursts in on his aunt and demands answers. Her aunt confirms that Kessa was indeed married off to another man. He lunges towards her, drawing his sword from the hilt, exclaiming, Ever since I last saw Kessa, which literally was a few hours ago, I have been ill, and I cannot and will not live without her. This is all your fault. You are my enemy. You shall die. And then I will kill myself, and we will die together. Prepare yourself. So meanwhile, Kessa was informed earlier that day of an unknown samurai seen in town aggressively interrogating locals on her whereabouts and marital status. Rushing back to her mother's home, she finds her worst fears are confirmed. With no time to think, Kessa dives in, shielding her mother from Mongaku's blade. <clears throat> Mongaku is paralyzed by the sight of Kessa. He is intoxicated by her beauty and overwhelmed with the sweet perfume wafting from her long hair. Kessa sits up, away from her cowering mother, to compose herself. She smooths out glistening locks and prepares to speak. Please, dear friend, don't take this out on my poor mother. She rests her hand on his sword hilt as he trembles with all the